Good evening. I'm Maria Paletta, state politics reporter with the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com. Last week, we began a series of debates broadcast live from the Republic newsroom in downtown Phoenix. Tonight, we focus on the state attorney general's race, which pits Republican incumbent Mark Burnovich against Democratic challenger January Contreras. Last month, we invited both candidates to participate in a debate on a day of their choosing. Only Ms. Contreras accepted. So tonight, we will be giving her 30 minutes to answer questions about her record and her vision for the Attorney General's office. Mr. Burnovich has agreed to answer questions live on Monday, October 22nd. Let's get started. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Thanks Appreciate for having me. Appreciate you making time. For those of our viewers and readers who are not as familiar with your campaign, could you start by talking a little bit about what motivated you to run? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you look at my career, you'll understand how it landed here, although um, I wouldn't have known that, you know, two years mm -hmm. ago. Um, but I'm a former county prosecutor, former assistant attorney general. Um, I worked for Janet Napolitano as an advisor in the governor's office in the Department of Homeland Security and came home from the Obama administration and started a nonprofit law firm. Uh, we represent kids and young adults dealing with homelessness, abuse, trafficking, and the foster care system. Uh, and it's all that work coming together coupled with, you know, this is my home. I'm a fourth generation Arizona and I love my state. And it became clear, especially as someone who's been around in the AG's office, in the governor's office, um, that, that checks and balances that we used to have, where people would call each other out, you would see some of that accountability. Mm -hmm. We don't have that anymore. And the attorney general's office is critical in that respect. And the truth is we're seeing some of the most consequential decisions being made in courtrooms. Right. Uh, and so when your courts and your lawyers matter more than ever, then so too does who sits in the Attorney General's mm -hmm. office. And I want to make sure that the people of Arizona, that we, myself included, have someone there who's fighting for the people of Arizona. That should be a given. Right. Um, so I know that we will get into your opponent, A.G. Bernovich's record, a little later. Speaking about the office in general and how things are run, the divisions that we're looking at, overall strategy, what are some areas where you think the Attorney General could be doing a better job, sort of in terms of your vision? Right. Well, I think, you know, it does start with what's the focus of your Attorney General, your top leader in the office, uh, because there are always going to be good attorneys in the Attorney General's office who are not there for political reasons, who are there because they believe in public service, just like when I was there. Um, but when you have a, a leader that's so focused on partisan agendas or special interests, then you're taking away resources that could be spent on the core mission of the office. Uh, and so we have important responsibilities, right? We touch every kid who enters the foster care system. Uh, we prosecute cases that, crimes that happens in nursing homes, like I did when I was an assistant attorney general. Consumer protection is huge, um, and we need to be doing the work that we're doing now and also taking on some of the big uh, challenges that can be taken on nationally. We, in the past, have been national leaders on consumer protection. Uh, and, and we need to make sure we're protecting everyone's constitutional rights. Um, that's not always happening right now and that should be, it was very concerning to me. Um, we have an environmental division that can be doing a lot of work to protect our environment right here, our clean air, clean water. Uh, and so, you know, those are important parts of the office, along with its given mission every day of providing sound advice to state agencies. You mentioned that uh, if you were to be elected, this wouldn't be your first time in the AG's office since you served as Assistant Attorney General. What do you consider your biggest accomplishment from your time there? I know you mentioned a couple of key points of, of issues or areas that you worked on, but what's the major accomplishment? Oh, I think we created some really great relationships uh, with people in the senior um, sector. Uh, and so we went to nursing homes, we would give training, we would give training around senior advocates. Uh, and that was important because what we wanted people to know is that if they saw something, whether it's theft or abuse in a nursing home, then they know how to recognize it. And they know that if they bring it forward, someone's gonna do something about it, which is very important. You know, too often we hear of people who 
see something that they think really is concerning, but they don't report it because they're, they don't believe anything will be done. And so I think those relationships were really key. The nonprofit that you started, as you mentioned, provides lawyers to children and young adults who have experienced homelessness, problems in the foster care system, other types of trauma. I know at the federal level you also helped establish the Council on Combating Violence Against Women. What spurred you to focus on advocating for women and children in, during that part of your career? When I got to the Department of Homeland Security, um, the the White House, the President had established this White House Council on Women and Girls. And um, the Secretary Napolitano appointed me as her designee. And so we had to figure out these, you know, the, the President actually set out these are the four things we're going to focus on. You know, what is your agency? Where can you contribute the most? And for us, it really was violence against women. At that time, um, there were instances where there, you had battered women or, or kids or whatever the situation, you had victims of crime who were immigrants, undocumented and afraid to call the police, or uh, cases where a, a battered woman called the police and because of her immigration status mm -hmm. was detained. Uh, and those were big things that we wanted to take on and we ended up putting out brand new training for federal uh, law enforcement. We put out guides and training for local and state law enforcement and I'm, I'm really proud of that work. And coming home, um, you, know, you just see all the need. And for me, it was, I really felt a connection to that work. I could mm -hmm. see there wasn't enough, um, enough voices in those space. And so uh, I joined the board of the Arizona Coalition to End Domestic uh, sec and Sexual and Violence and um, started doing the work and really asking a lot of questions to figure out if the need was really there. But when right. it came to legal services, it was clear that the need was there. I know we've had a change in the federal administration since then, of course. Under the Trump administration, attorneys general have intervened in a series of very high profile national, national policy fights. Excuse me. Which of those interventions have you supported? So it is, you know, you, we watch, and it's not surprising, as I mentioned, when the courts become so important uh, and the last place where people's rights are really going to be upheld then it, you, we have watched the Democratic Attorneys General step forward to most often enforce the Constitution or consumer protections. Um, and so there have been, I, I want to be clear that I don't plan to sit there and spend you know, time after time thinking you know, that the federal administration is the biggest issue because we have a lot of issues right here in Arizona. Uh, but there have been significant ones. These kids and parents being separated at the border. Uh, as someone who worked at the Department of Homeland Security, when I started seeing that, I knew there were families they were not going to be able to put back together. They don't have, they, that, they're not resourced that way. Uh, and so for me it was looking at, that's a case where no one's going to be able to speak up for these kids and their parents. And I'm proud that attorneys generals around the country, not here but elsewhere, stood up to enforce the law. And a judge came forward and said, that's right, this needs to stop. Here are the deadlines. Uh, and none of that would happen without that kind of litigation. So that's one case where we need to be. Um, you know, right now, our attorney general, current attorney general, is suing to eliminate the Affordable Care Act. Um, and with that, it means he's suing to eliminate guarantees for people with pre-existing health conditions. On day one, I would get us out of that lawsuit and join the other lawsuit. There is another lawsuit going on to keep those protections mm -hmm. for people with pre-existing health conditions in place. That's the job of the Attorney General, is to be on the side of the people of Arizona. And uh, you mentioned health care, which was something I was going to ask about because it seems to be a central part of your campaign, both in terms of your record and what you've worked on in the past and going forward. I was going to ask how you would or could help Arizonans in that area. Um, are there, is there anything you want to mention beyond that particular strategy? Well, I mean, the, the making sure we're using the courts to fight for people here on the ground, of course, is should be the, the basic instinct of anyone who is elected to the Attorney General's office. And it, it's shocking that it's not for the current Attorney General. But there are other things around healthcare, um, you know, people with disabilities, people who have been denied benefits. I mean, there are a lot of ways to make sure that we're doing the best we can to protect the rights 
uh, use the laws we have to protect people's access to the services that they're paying for. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, you have vowed to protect working families and small businesses from scams, exploitation, if elected. How do you propose to do that? Well, I think it's watching what's going on. Um, and again, it, it, you know, and this is an area where you have a lot of attorneys general, um, the, the assistant attorneys general that are doing this work. And the more that people come to know the attorney general as their champion, the more cases we get. There are um, other states where it's just common knowledge. They know what their attorney general does. Uh, and they know that if they've been had, so to speak, right. they call their Literally attorney general you. and something happens. Uh, and that's the kind of culture that we need to build, build here. Okay. Do you think any changes moving toward the state side of things, since I know you said that would be your primary focus, of course, do you think any changes need to be made to the state's medical marijuana program? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I, as I've watched it, um, the people of Arizona passed uh, a ballot initiative to say, yes, this is something that's really important to us. Um, I've watched the Department of Health Services, people that I know and that I respect, put together a, a really good um, regulatory scheme. And, you know, when you're coupling that to make sure that you have the right regulation, that, you, you know, we're the keeping public safety mm -hmm. in mind. So this is really balancing public safety and public health. Uh, and so far it seems to me that we are doing a, a good job of, of living out the voter's will and protecting public safety and public health at the same time. You talked about constitutional rights or human rights. Do you think Arizona should have a statewide anti-discrimination ordinance that includes sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes? And if so, do you think that there should be a religious freedom exemption to that? I, I think it's very basic and important that we make sure that we're not discriminating against people for who they are. And that includes for who they love. Uh, and so, yes, that is something that I support. I, I have no doubt that we'll get there. I really don't. Um, there, there's a, a, a plurality that's focused on um, this partisan agenda, but I think when we start to sit down and we bring some balance back to state government, we have people from different parties in place, and we start to actually talk again. The way that I used to see Governor Napolitano on the ninth floor with you know, leaders from the committees who were Republicans in the legislature and figure out what's the way forward. I, I really think when we start talking, when we bring in um, real people, men and women who are affected by that, who can share their stories, that in fact we will get there. Something that has had bipartisan support in Arizona are efforts to combat the opioid and heroin epidemics. Mm -hmm. I know in your uh, nonprofit work you said you've seen the consequences of that. If elected, how would you work to end that epidemic? Well, the opioid epidemic and heroin, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we're seeing multiple forms now of the same drug. Um, in many states, in fact, I'd say most, the Attorney General is the lead. Mm -hmm. The Attorney General is taking the charge to fight this. Um, now, I, I, you know, I know the Governor's Office has been the lead here, uh, and that we'll work together or, or you know, take the leadership role, because it's a very important part of the mm -hmm. Attorney General's responsibility. Um, what I see as being key is, you know, the, the legislature and the Governor passed some bipartisan legislation, um, which is a really important start. And where I see one area that we left unanswered is we really do have the responsibility, as many other states are, to go after these drug companies, the drug distributors, the drug manufacturers, who are making a lot of profit off the pain of people here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have met parents, I have met grandparents along this campaign who have held my hand and shared um, their, their sadness and their pain, um, whether they lost someone in their family or whether that person is still there but um, causes such heartache for him or herself, for her kids. Uh, and so we need to keep those people's faces in our minds as we're dealing with this. And it's an important avenue that we have to go after these drug companies that are making a lot of money to bring some of that money back home so that we can fund treatment, so that we can make sure that we're, uh, you know, for me, targeting 
families for treatment with kids in the foster care system is, is incredibly important because we have to do everything we can to try to allow a family to be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a big picture. It, it takes a lot of collaboration. Right. I expect to work with uh, law enforcement and community advocates, faith-based groups all around the state. Uh, and, and I think they're ready for that. You mentioned law enforcement, border security and immigration related topics have been, uh, have played a central role in several state races. Sometimes the conversation involves things that can be changed by state officials. Sometimes they're more about federal issues that um, state officials may or may not be able to yeah. intervene in. Do you see a role for the state in immigration related crimes? Well, I think any transnational crime, right? Any crime that's coming across our, our border um, is our problem mm -hmm. uh, and one that we should and can be addressing. So, you know, I, I've worked on human trafficking cases, for example. Now, most of my cases have been right here, young people from our own country. Mm -hmm. But we also have had some cases where our survivors are from other countries and seen how that path looks uh, what happened along the way, um, and absolutely, as, as, as law enforcement, we need to be working with federal officials, we need to be working with our county sheriffs. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with county sheriffs uh, in, on different ends of the state, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they care, they care about these crimes, they care about the opioid epidemic, but you know what, when I, I sat down with one of these county sheriffs, the one thing he said that nobody talks about is, the fact that, and this goes back to opioids, but the, in his county, they don't have any treatment places mm -hmm. available. And so it really is having a, a big picture mind about what are the real issues. And so we need to investigate, we need to prosecute, but we also need to do what we can to make communities whole. And so if that means that I need to be at the legislature or in the governor's office asking him, you know, to to work into these requirement, these contracts mm -hmm. with whoever the prov healthcare providers are that the state pays, then we need to make sure that they understand they have an obligation to get treatment available to everybody in the state. Those supplementary services. Mm -hmm. You've said your opponent, incumbent Mark Brnovich, quote, uses taxpayer funding for purely political fights that don't represent Arizona interests. It sounded like you alluded to some of those earlier, but could you provide some examples? Yeah, I mean, I think the lawsuit to end uh, protections for people with pre-existing health conditions is entirely partisan uh, and at the end of the day is designed to um, help special interests. Uh, there's, it's, there's no way that that is in fact about protecting the people of Arizona because it's gonna be really painful if they win that lawsuit and if people are left without health care again. I, you know, I was the health policy advisor to Governor Napolitano I have spent time with small business owners, with parents uh, who are consultants, self-employed, who had a child with um, chronic illness, and who suddenly found their lives um, changed by a healthcare condition. And so I think that's, that's a real big example. What's another, um, you know, this week, or, or in the last several days, the Supreme Court finally stopped um, litigation that was trying to allow for uranium mining in protected lands near the Grand Canyon. Uh, you know, Mark Brnovich was a part of that lawsuit through to the first court and to the Court of Appeals. Uh, what does that have to do with um, protecting the people of Arizona? It's, it's a, you know, he joined the mining industry in that brief. Uh, and so I think those are some examples. ExxonMobil uh, you know, ExxonMobil is being investigated by an attorney general in another state. They didn't want to comply with the investigation, and so who comes forward? A few attorneys general, including Mark Brnovich, to try to say because of their um, rights, they shouldn't have to turn over evidence in this investigation. Uh, those are things that, again, they just don't have to do with Arizonans. We need to bring our focus right here. And it's um, offensive that taxpayer money is being spent on those kinds of cases. One of his other more controversial stances involved his opposition to driver's licenses for DACA recipients or DREAMers. Where do you stand on that issue? 
Uh, well, I mean, that's over, finally. I mean, Mark Brnovich took it all the way to the United States Supreme Court to be given a final no, get your briefcase and go home. Um, it, in fact, was not legally defensible to try to take driver's licenses away from um, these young people who have the legal right to live and work here as deemed by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and so I was um, not surprised by the court's decision to that, that went against uh, Brnovich's uh, agenda, but I uh, was glad to see that it ended that way. I know he has also been an advocate of increased charter school oversight, which has had some bipartisan support, particularly recently. What are your thoughts on charter school reform when it comes to their finances, conflict of interest laws, and so forth? I know the legislature takes the major role here, right. but since you would have an advisory role, interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's first important to Note, Mark Brnovich didn't talk about charter school accountability until, uh, you know, two months before this election. And he's had three years and eight months to talk about what is important to him. He, in fact, has run bills at the legislature. None of them had to do with charter school accountability. So um, I think for those who called this out as a political stunt, he, he understands this is a very close race. Uh, and, you know, suddenly he had an epiphany about the need for charter school reform. Um, now, I already had put out uh, a statements around charter school accountability. I think it's, it's very important. You know, charter schools are here. They have a role. Many parents choose charter schools, but I think all of us as taxpayers, we want the same transparency and accountability because at the end of the day, that's our taxpayer money. There is not enough uh, public funding for our public schools and so to watch someone become a millionaire off of a charter school um, is, is painful and I'll tell you I'm, just last week I met a teacher who choked up a little bit as she told me that she grew up middle class and because she chooses to be a teacher that she can't allow her children to grow up middle class uh, I haven't stopped thinking about her saying that. And knowing that there are charter school owners that are becoming millionaires, while this woman who does her duty every day because she believes in the enrichment of, of our kids in schools, um, you know, can't live the life that she envisioned for her kids, uh, it, it just, we have to do something about it. And, and you know, if Mark Brnovich really believed it, he would have talked about this sometime before in his three years and eight months. He didn't. I will really take this seriously. I will really do something about it. And we do need new laws, but I'm not convinced that we don't even have some authority as it exists now to investigate some of the things that have been happening. I see. Last year, I know I know you mentioned disabilities earlier, um, disability issues sort of under the umbrella of health care. But last year on the legal side, um, the AG sought to tamp down what he viewed as excessive lawsuits brought against small businesses under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, we, of course, have the state level counterpart. Mm -hmm. An advocacy organization at the time had filed more than a thousand lawsuits against small businesses based on parking requirement violations under the ADA. And the AG first sought to have those cases consolidated into one proceeding and then move for them to be dismissed. There were very mixed uh, feelings yeah. on that decision. The move was heralded by businesses, particularly small businesses, and those leaders uh, as positive, but really decried by disability rights advocates. How would you have handled that situation? Do you think that that was the appropriate move? Well, it certainly was an abuse of power by the lawyers that brought these cases mm -hmm. forward. Uh, and as a lawyer, you always want everyone in our, your profession to act with integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I share the opinion that that lawyer was not acting with integrity uh, based on what I read. Right. Um, I think what was missing was a, a lot more conversation with the disability community themselves, um, with individuals who could really share another perspective. Uh, and you know, I think that's the main thing I would have done differently, is make sure that we're sitting down, that we're talking to business owners. E even I had friends who were business owners to ask me their opinion about this. That's right. how rapid, rampant this was. Um, but we also needed to sit down with the disability community and understand, um, you know, where where does it lie? Because I think most of them could see this wasn't right either. 
but you know, where was the real solution mm -hmm. to happen? Um, and, and then, I don't know what would have come out of those conferences. We don't know when we missed that opportunity. Uh, but I do think it was an, an issue that needed to be addressed. I just would have made sure it was one that was very, very informed. No, no surprises. We're walking through this as a community together, the, the disability community, the business leaders, um, and figuring out the way forward. Mm -hmm. It was definitely a difficult situation. Shifting gears a little bit, because I know we only have a few minutes left, minority representation has come up multiple times over the course of some of these statewide races. And if you're elected, I believe you'd be the first Latina to serve as the state's top legal officer. Is that something that's significant to you? Do you feel that minority representation in, in top legal posts is lacking? Huh. Um, I mean, I think that First of all, we need someone with integrity and someone who's committed to the people of Arizona. Um, I certainly have met a lot of people during this campaign who are excited, whether it's you know because it's this chance to have mm -hmm. um, a Latina in the Attorney General's office, or a woman, or a mom, or someone who came have experienced the nonprofit mm -hmm. side of the world. Um, but and I, I just think you know our our leadership is always going to be best when it reflects the people of Arizona, the, the communities that we're serving. Um, and, but I think at the end of the day, you know, uh, that people want someone who's qualified, who's experienced, who has values that they can believe in. Uh, and, I, and I think when that package comes in something that looks like them or looks different even, mm -hmm. I think part of this is just new faces mm -hmm. is exciting for people. Um, then those things all come together. It sounds like you kind of answered my final question, but I'll ask it anyway in case you wanted to add anything. I was going to ask, uh, Republicans, of course, generally have an advantage in Arizona, red state, and we also have many independent voters. Why should those voters support you? You know, I've met a lot of Republicans and a lot of independents along with, you know, many Democrats in the campaign. And what I see is that more or less people want the same thing. They, they want honest brokers in government again. They don't want hidden agendas. They don't want people who are doing the bidding of big donors or political insiders. Uh, and they want someone who, who's, who understands um, society and doesn't have this us versus them mentality. That's, those are the people that I'm meeting of all pol political persuasions. Uh, and so I think for people who are looking for that, there, there is only one candidate in this race um, that brings those qualities forward, and, and that's sitting here with you. Um, you know, uh, Arizonans, historically, I think, they, they like someone who hustles. They like someone who's not afraid of standing up to the status quo. Uh, and I think those are important reasons uh, that make me the, the right choice and that I, I would ask for them to take a good look at when they're choosing who to vote for. Thank you again for coming, spending time Thank with you. us. That's all the time we have for tonight. Join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. for the Phoenix mayoral debate.